Even though his life was cut short, Satoshi Kon left behind a legacy of incredible filmmaking. His work helped pave the way to popularize anime in the West and influenced many Hollywood directors. Admittedly, I only heard about this anime legend a couple of years ago when a friend of mine insisted I watch Perfect Blue. A few days later, I did just that, and I began to fall in love with the works of Satoshi Kon. Since then, I have read and watched everything the man has ever touched with a 10-foot pole, and researching his life in a way that dips into stalker territory. Khan was born in Hokkaido, Japan on October 12, 1963. He showed an early interest in painting and enrolled in the Mushishino Art University. He quickly switched to graphic design and began making manga. Before his anime career took off, Khan was a fairly successful manga artist, and many of his original works are still available online. Dream Fossil, a collection of short stories he published in a series of magazines, is full of tales from many genres. You can really start to see the origins of Khan's themes taking root as he experiments through the book with the kinds of stories he wants to tell. Seraphim 26661333 Wings was a manga Khan made with Mamoru Oshii of Ghost in the Shell fame back in 1995. I was so excited to see these two anime legends working together. The story follows the aftermath of an angel plague, a pandemic that induces apocalyptic visions in those afflicted, as well as contorting their bodies into dead, seraphic forms. Whether this illness was sent to cure or kill humanity, our characters are out to find the truth, with Oshi's trademark basset hound and a strange young girl following them all the way. It's a very intriguing premise, and it's easy to see how Khan's influence progressively became more prominent. Sadly, though, the manga is still unfinished and will likely remain that way, which was highly disappointing. The story was also paced very slowly, leaving us with very few straws to grasp at to guess what the conclusion might have been. Opus, though, his last work as a mangaka is really where his passion for duality begins to shine through. In an interview with Susumu Hirasawa, an amazing composer who frequently worked with Khan, he stated, Extreme paradoxes. Opposites. The dual nature of a single thing. Plot twists that don't connect contextually when thought of using regular logic, yet suddenly make sense when thought of in the context of dreams. These are the ways in which Khan would always explore the duality of everything. Opus follows the story of a manga artist named Chikara Nagi and his quest to finish his manga series called Resonance. When he tries to do this, however, his characters come to life and steal the final pages. As the story progresses, the lines between the worlds begin to blur as we explore the duality of our reality. It also presents several philosophical predicaments, like the ethics of forcing your sentient characters to suffer for the entertainment of readers. It also begs the question that if the characters and stories are alive, couldn't we just be characters inside a larger story? Would that make the world we live in any less real? But I digress, the characters are compelling and I highly recommend the manga. Well, at least to those who don't mind its lack of official ending. That's right, this time I said official ending! Due to his publisher's magazine shutting down and his anime career taking off, Khan was never able to finish Opus the way he wanted to. However, he did construct a one-chapter conclusion, which was found and published after his death. Though hasty and still in its rough thumb form, it's a fun read and a rather fitting ending to the story. Khan's love of duality shines most prominently in his next work, his debut film, Perfect Blue. The contrast between the two Mimas, the online world versus reality, and Mima's life versus Double Bind blend together excellently to make it an incredible psychological thriller. The story follows a young woman named Mima as she transitions from being a pop star to being an actress. Not everything goes as planned, however, and as the movie progresses, Mima begins to descend into madness, bringing the viewer along with her. What struck me most at first watch was Khan's skill at adding realism to the story. One of the main reasons horror and anime rarely mix well together is the lack of realism. Horror movies depend on the viewer seeing the events as they relate to themselves. Without personal investment, the movies are a lot less frightening. Since anime tends to be, well, animated, a key part of realism has already been lost, so creators tend to go to higher extremes to make the events more jarring. Khan, though, managed to relate to the viewers, getting under their skin, by telling the story subjectively through Mima's eyes. We perceive the situations exactly how Mima does, getting lost between the realm of reality and fantasy. The themes explored also help increase realism. Watching Mima's internet persona start to get away from her mirrors how many interact with the internet today. For most of you, the part of yourself you're putting online isn't the real you, but you as you want to be perceived. Khan managed to predict in the late 90s just how terrifying it would be to lose control of that persona. What I love most about the film are the excellent experiences I get every time I watch it. 
Every viewing, I notice something different with a symbolism or visuals that drastically changes the way I see the events the film portrays. Every viewing of Perfect Blue is unique, and that's one of the reasons it's my favorite of Khan's work. After the success of Perfect Blue, Khan wanted to create a film adaptation of the novel Paprika. However, it was cut short when the company he was working for went bankrupt. He then joined up with Studio Madhouse, the company that continued to produce all of his projects from this point on. Khan's next directorial work was Millennium Actress, coming out in 2001. Now well into old age, famed actress Chiyoko Fujiwara is approached by a filmmaker to create a documentary about her life. The movie then follows her as she recounts the tales of her journey and the movies she starred in. Utilizing brilliant cinematography, the film weaves seamlessly between her real life and film characters once again, touching upon Khan's famed theme of duality. It's incredibly easy to get lost between the two, not really knowing just what is real and what is not, and that was certainly intentional. Trying to confuse the viewer in this way, Khan is insinuating that it doesn't matter what's real or not. All the events we're viewing are important and real in how they affect Chiyoko, and trying to decipher real from fiction is the antithesis of the movie's message. The part I really loved was chasing him, says Chiyoko in the final scene. The thrill of the chase, not the destination but the journey, that is the key theme of the film. So reaching an end-all be-all conclusion doesn't really matter. All that truly mattered was the journey that brought us there. Tokyo Godfathers, premiering in 2003, was Khan's next film. Telling the story of a drunk, a drag queen, and a runaway, this Christmas story follows their attempts to return an abandoned baby to its family. It's quite a comedic and poignant story with relatable characters and a fun twist on the old three men and a baby trope. Though it may be different from his other works, you can still see Khan in this movie, in the visual storytelling, underlying meaning, and cinematic elegance. Over the years, Khan had come up with many story ideas that wouldn't quite fit into a whole movie. So in 2004, he decided to combine them in a 13-episode series called Paranoia Agent. This show tells the tale of Little Slugger, or Shonen Bat in the Japanese, a young boy riding around town on rollerblades, whacking people over the head with a baseball bat. But are we sure that's what the show's about? And perhaps it's about the mad delusions of a girl under intense pressure that got a little too out of hand. Or could it be both? As Khan stated in an interview, the origin of the idea was that kids tend to get stomach aches when they don't want to go to school. Today, even grown-ups use that excuse without shame. I don't think that's a lie, it, it really does hurt, but it's not an illness. You can never specify the cause of a stomach ache. I think it's sort of a self-defense system. What I, Satoshi Khan, a 40-year-old animation creator, want to do is insist that it is a self-defense system all right, but the kid himself is definitely responsible as well. This anime is largely about how different people with different circumstances and problems react to being put under extreme stress. It's absolutely fascinating to watch the series and follow each unique character to their breaking point. Similar to Perfect Blue, this episodic show is told subjectively, putting us directly into the shoes of the characters. It's a character piece that delves into human nature and our collective need to escape reality. If I had to use one word to describe this anime, it would be interesting. It's a gem in a sea of tropes and archetypes. It's a show that sticks with you, thanks, of course, to the masterful storytelling of its creator. Khan's last feature film was a culmination of all of his anime career. He finally got to make the adaptation of Paprika he'd always dreamed of. Premiering in 2006, it tells the story of a doctor named Atsuko Chiba and her colleagues as they develop the DC Mini, a device to help psychiatric patients by viewing their dreams. However, in the wrong hands, that device could destroy minds and reality as we know it. There isn't much I can say about Paprika that I haven't already stated about Khan's other works. The beautiful and haunting dreamscapes work to unravel the human psyche, both metaphorically and literally for the characters. Khan's themes of duality, of course, make their appearance in Atsuko's alter ego of Paprika, and again in the blurred lines between reality and fantasy. It's a timeless classic, and hearing Susumu Hirasawa's OST for the movie never fails to put a smile on my face. This movie highlights all the reasons I fell in love with Khan's work, from the gorgeous visuals, expert framing, and paradoxical storytelling. After Paprika, Khan took a break from film. He made a one-minute short for Annie Curry 15 called Ohio about the struggle to get up in the morning, a short that is actually available on YouTube, so go check that out, link in the doobly-doo. After that project, Khan began working on his next film, entitled Dreaming Machine. He was working on Dreaming Machine when he died at age 46 of pancreatic cancer. The Madhouse attempted to complete and publish the film in 2012, then ran into financial difficulties and had to put the project on hold. 
Now, I'm not going to lie to you. This video is clearly lacking in my usual analysis and philosophy, and the reason I posted it this week is because my Full Metal Alchemist video isn't done editing yet. But I really think it's important to continue talking about Satoshi Khan to keep his work and style alive. You can tell by watching any of his pieces the amount of passion and effort put into them by him and his creative team. His movies aren't about tired tropes, they're about people. To conclude with another quote from Hirasawa in regards to the unfinished dreaming machine. It's fine in itself to come away from the film thinking, that robot was cute, or ah, oh, what a heartwarming human drama. But if you seek a deeper meaning, you'll think instead, there was such a weighty theme within that style of artwork. When viewed from that perspective, the meaning of the final scene shifts, and here opinion will be divided. But I think Khan would watch the audience and laugh to himself and think, I'm the only one who truly understands. But in fact, it's when I think of Khan smirking while observing the audience from a slightly different dimension that I can sense his love for the audience. So, what's your favorite work of Satoshi Khan's? Let me know down in the comments! If any of these descriptions piques your interest, I highly recommend checking them out. They are well worth it. If you're interested in hearing more from me, you can follow me on Twitter, link down below, or subscribe to the channel. That'd be nice. Like, share, and all that jazz, and I'll see you guys next week. Goodbye.